Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. About 30 years ago, my father, Albert, Big Al Lemoyne, bought a used truck and started moving food, furniture, and anything else he could haul in and out of Lake Charles, Louisiana. I'm his only child, Albert Little Al. And that's what everybody calls me. Little Al. Not Albert. Not Al. But always Little Al. I learned to live with it. As years went by and the city's industry grew, so did Cajun Cartage, the name my father gave to the company which now consisted of 300 trucks and 400 trailers. We were, by now, running trucks throughout the lower 48 states and Canada. It was assumed that I would work in the company and eventually take it over, an assumption I fully supported. I started working in the garage at age 15. Changing tires, changing oil, giving lube jobs, replacing brakes, and every other dirty job consistent with running a trucking company. When I turned 18, in the summer between my junior and senior years in high school, my father moved me into the front office to learn the business. I found that being in an air-conditioned office and being clean was much better than working in the garage. It seemed to take most of the summer to get all of the grease out from under my fingernails. The summer before I started college, we hired a young lady to work in our safety office. Her job was to review the paperwork our drivers were required to fill out and submit. I found myself spending a lot of time in the safety office. Her name was Jennifer Broussard. She was one year older than me and had just graduated from the other high school in town. She was a redhead with a perfect body and was unbelievably beautiful. And I was in love. We dated that summer. A lot. We had sex that summer. A lot. I was not her first, but she was mine. She seemed to know her way around, and I certainly didn't mind letting her refine her skills with me. God, she made me feel good. As I said, she was my first, and as I found out during my ensuing college years, she was the best. A natural-born talent when it came to sex. I found out from her that two other guys had sex with her before me and that we were all three in doubt about the same. I do not recall how or why that tidbit of information came about, but it did. She loved to have sex and she did it well. Goddamn, I was one happy kid that summer. But all good things must end. And I thought they did. I went to college in Baton Rouge. After spending the summer with Jennifer, I wanted to stay in town and attend our local university so she and I could continue our wanton ways. But my father insisted on Baton Rouge, and since he was paying the bills I went to Baton Rouge. I was resigned to spending my semesters either in class or my dorm room deep in study. Boy, was I wrong. My first two college years were sex and beer filled. I screwed any glory hole I could find. I thought my summer with Jennifer was great, but I learned plenty about other local women during those first two years in Baton Rouge. I barely managed to eke out a very low C grade average those first two years. Not that I had forgotten about Jennifer. My college summers were spent in Lake Charles working for my father and screwing Jennifer. The first college summer was a rehash of my first summer with Jennifer. Working and having sex. I was now working in our operations division and she was still in the safety office, but we found lots of time to spend together. Other employees of the company started telling me about Jennifer's escapades during my absence. Apparently, she and several of our truck drivers had become friendly and whenever they came through town they would get together and party. Since we were a 48 state and Canada operation, our drivers could and would spend up to two weeks on the road without coming through Lake Charles. She also apparently enjoyed the company of one of senior members of the safety office staff. This relationship was not as open as her driver relationships were, but it existed nonetheless. I had no problem with this in that I was doing the same thing in Baton Rouge, and neither Jennifer nor I had any claims on each other. We were free to screw anyone we wanted to. Not that it was a topic of conversation between us, but it was an unspoken agreement. If one of her driver friends was in town, she was free to spend time with him, and at least in one case I heard about. Her. This worked pretty well that first summer and even the first part of the next summer. But then things started to change. My junior year in Baton Rouge was one of discovery. I found that I enjoyed my classes and looked forward to learning. I also found that my social life had taken a big hit. I was still drinking some beer and doing any glory hole that presented itself, but I was not actively going out and looking for it. My grades improved and I looked forward to getting home and working over the summer. My third summer found me still in the operations office, but now I was almost in charge. My relationship with Jennifer also changed. Our time together was spent enjoying each other. The frenetic getting naked and screwing had lessened and had begun to settle down to dinners, conversation, and just plain old enjoyment of each other's company. We had weekend trips to Houston for theater, 
a five-day ocean cruise out of New Orleans, a couple of trips to Kima, Texas, for dinner and fun. All in all, our relationship was growing, and we seemed to grow with it. She was now the only person I wanted to spend time outside of the company with, and it was the same with her. Her tryst with our drivers dwindled to zero, and we even discussed moving in together, but never quite got that far. My schedule for my senior year was such that I was only required to be in class Monday through Thursday. That meant that all of my weekends were three-day events. I spent Friday and Saturday at the office, but my nights and Sunday belonged to Jennifer. As a graduation gift, my parents sent us on a seven-day Alaska cruise. It was while we were in Skagway at one of the saloons popular with tourists that I asked Jennifer to marry me. It might be interesting to note that the actual location of my proposal was in the brothel museum section of the saloon. I did not plan it that way. It just seemed like the thing to do at the time. The wedding was normal by any standard and we rented a house not too far from the junkyard, which is what most drivers call their company location. We were not sure exactly where we wanted our permanent home to be so we had planned to take our time and look around. Within two years of the wedding, I became the general manager and Jennifer became the director of safety. I was now 24 and Jennifer was 25. Life was good. Then it got better. Jennifer got pregnant and our first child, Jonathan Russell Lemoyne, was born and Jennifer resigned from the company to become a stay-at-home mom. Eleven months after that, Laura Elizabeth Lemoyne made her debut. Our lives were pretty much perfect for the next ten years. Then the shit hit the fan. My mother developed a particularly rare and devastating form of cancer called DPG, or diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. She died less than five months after diagnosis. My father died with her. Not physically, but he may as well have. For the last 44 years, his life was my mother, me, and then the company. After she died, he spent part of every day at the cemetery. If it rained, he sat in the car and stared at her tombstone. He never came to the office after her death. He said that he had built it for her, and with her gone, it meant nothing anymore. He wanted to be with her and talked of killing himself so he could be, but fortunately, I convinced him that I needed him. He began to believe that Jennifer... Jonathan and Laura needed him as well, so he began to live a little more. He convinced us to move into the house he had shared with my mother. We could breathe much-needed life back into both him and the house, and it would be less like a prison with us there. So, some semblance of normalcy returned. Jennifer would take the kids to school so Dad could sleep in. Then he would leave in the afternoons, stop by the graveyard, then pick the kids up. He still never came to the office. Jonathan was now 17 and Laura 16. Jennifer was still beautiful and sex was still wonderful. I was doing some traveling to see customers, but not much, and the trips never lasted more than three days. We now had 400 trucks and 600 trailers and business had never been better. I was sitting in my father's office at home going over some proposed freight rates for our customers one evening, and he came in, closed the door, and sat down. He reached over to the humidor he kept on his desk and took out one of his cigars. He used to really enjoy them, but mom would only allow him to smoke them in his office with the door closed and the special air filtration system for that room turned on. He hadn't touched a cigar since mom died and those in the humidor had not been replaced. When he lit that dry sucker and inhaled, I thought he was going to have a stroke. He choked and coughed and sputtered and sneezed. I laughed my ass off after I saw that he was not, in fact, having a stroke. After things settled down and he had dumped the rest of the cigars into the waste basket and washed away the taste of the cigar with a couple of fingers of Jack Daniels, he started to talk. He had decided to rejoin the ranks of the living but on his terms. He was going to sell the business and travel. He and mom had always wanted to and had talked of far off and exotic places but they never seemed to get around to actually doing it. He had been thinking about this for the last several months and had been in contact with a friend of his in Denver, John Franklin who also owned a successful mid-sized trucking company. In the past, he and dad had talked about joining forces, but they had both wanted to be the boss, so it didn't happen. Anyway, unbeknownst to any of us, the two of them had come to terms. All that had to be finished was a review of our equipment and property inventories and customer base. If these were as advertised, the sale would happen. The agreed-upon sale price was $52 million. Not too bad for a guy who started with a used truck, but his selling the company and traveling wasn't all. He wanted me to take half of the money and retire so that I can spend much more time with my family. I could watch the kids continue to grow. I could send them to the best possible schools and buy a big house for Jennifer. But he also wanted us to travel with him as much as we could. He said that we could hire a tutor for Jonathan and Laura and just travel. The tutor could travel with us and teach the kids about each country we spent time in. I was overwhelmed. 
There was no way I could give him an answer without first talking it over with Jennifer and the kids. They, especially the kids, would be giving up a lot. They would be leaving their friends in school. My father explained that we could take some of their friends on trips with us if we wanted. He had obviously given this a lot of thought because he had an answer for all of my questions. So I told him I would talk it over with the family. He asked me not to say anything to them or anybody else until the sale was finalized. He gave me the responsibility and the necessary powers of attorney to complete the sale. He said that he had not been part of the company since mom died, so he was asking me to finish it. Besides, he said, he wouldn't be available next week because he was going deep sea fishing. Now, I know for a fact that he had never been fishing in his life. He just didn't want to be there at the demise of his company. I was to leave the following Monday, and, if everything worked out, when I came home on Friday the company would belong to Franklin and we would be very comfortable for the rest of our lives. Jennifer was perfectly fine with my going to Denver for the week. She had meetings of the Arts Council and some other committee she was on, so she would not have time to miss me. Monday morning came and armed with certified inventories and copies of our base customer contracts I flew to Denver. John Franklin's general manager met me at the airport and took me to Franklin's office. There I met with his senior staff, and in the course of the next day, and a half satisfied them that all conditions of the sale had been met. They in turn satisfied me that transfer of funds would take place the minute my signature was affixed. By mid-afternoon on Tuesday it was done. I immediately called my father expecting my message to go to voicemail because he would be out of cell phone range in the Gulf. Fishing. Huh. Anyway, I made the call and he answered. He had decided that the water was too rough so he stayed at the hotel and sat by the pool. He was surprised to hear that it was all over. He thought it would take most of the week. I would fly back the next day and meet with our staff and get them up to speed on the change of ownership. I would also be handing out some rather substantial bonus checks to the office staff for their dedicated and loyal service. I told him that members of Franklin's organization would show up Monday morning and assume control. I took the early flight out of Denver Wednesday morning, and by mid-morning I found myself at the airport in Lake Charles. I had just put my carry-on in the back seat of my car and had gotten in the driver's seat. There is something you should know about our airport. It is small. There are only two airlines which serve Lake Charles, and you can go to or from either Houston or Dallas. A total of seven flights a day. I had flown from Denver to Houston, and after waiting for almost three hours instead of the scheduled one hour, I boarded my plane for the 30-minute flight to Lake Charles. The flights into Lake Charles are spaced so that it is rare that two airplanes are on the ground at the same time, but my delay caused such a rarity to happen. That day the flight from Dallas landed just shortly after my flight. So there I sat in my car ready to drive the 20 minutes home and ready, too, for one of Jennifer's perfect welcome home sex sessions. So, I started my car and looked out the windshield just in time to see Jennifer darting across the road from the parking lot to the terminal building. My initial reaction was to wonder how she knew I was coming home so early. So much for my father keeping a secret, I thought. So, I decided to stand outside the terminal and wait for her to come out. I walked over and stood beside one of the columns outside the building. I had been standing there no more than five minutes when I looked to see if I could see her coming out. And there she was, absolutely radiant, and clinging to the arm of Lenny Flat, our former director of safety and her former boss. They stopped halfway down the walkway. He put his carry-on bag on the ground and they wrapped their arms around each other. The kiss they exchanged caused several people to comment that they should hurry and find a room. I just stood there. They broke their embrace. He picked up his bag and arms around each other's waist, walked the rest of the way down the walkway, across the drive, into her car. I had not moved. As I watched her car start off airport property, something in me snapped. A calmness engulfed me as I walked the few steps to my car. I wanted to follow them to see what would happen, although in my heart, I thought I already knew. Our house was just 20 minutes from the airport, and it soon became apparent that was where they were headed. The houses in our neighborhood fronted on one of Lake Charles's beautiful old live oak tree-lined streets. An alley at the back of the houses provided access to the garages. I drove into the alley and passed our house just in time to see my garage door finish closing. I drove to the end of the alley and walked back to the house. I stood there trying to decide what to do next. I couldn't believe how calm I was. I knew deep in my soul that my wife would, in the next few minutes, be screwing another man unless I chose to try to prevent it. And what if I did prevent it? It would stop this single assignation, but would it prevent others? The familiarity I saw expressed at the airport caused me to believe that this was not the first time. So, it was too late to stop previous meetings and sex fests, so what would be gained by preventing this one? 
The damage has already been done, and she certainly cannot unscrew him. And by any definition, our marriage was over. So, I decided to wait. Give them a few more minutes to get into a compromising situation and burst in on them. There was a door leading from the backyard through the garage and into the kitchen. I quietly made my way into the kitchen. I saw Flat's carry-on bag sitting on the floor. His jacket was on the back of one barstool we had at our breakfast counter. I searched through his jacket and found his cell phone. I put it in my pocket. I made my way down the hall and, as would be expected, heard the sounds of sex. The moans and groans. The pleading to doing faster and harder. I took out Flat's phone and started recording the sound as I went down the hall. I got down and went the last several feet on my knees. As I got to the door, I started to brace myself for what I was about to see, but nothing happened. I didn't take a deep breath. I didn't hyperventilate. I wasn't sweating. I was calm and relaxed. As a matter of fact, I was concerned about my lack of concern. I didn't seem to care what she was doing or who she was doing it with. I raised his phone and aimed it where I thought I could get a good view of the bed and then stuck my arm around the door frame. I couldn't see what they were doing, but I could certainly hear them. I listened. No emotion dispassionate, removed, for about ten minutes, the words only I was supposed to hear, the voice begging someone other than me to pound her. My arm was tired from holding the phone and my knees were starting to hurt so I started to leave. Just then they began their big finish. And then, it was over. Silence for several seconds. If I knew Jennifer, she would lie there for several minutes basking in the afterglow and then she would head for the shower before starting round two. A plan started to form. It would only work if they showered together, however. I had dropped my arm and, again, started to leave but his words stopped me and I stuck the phone back up to record their conversation. So how long do you think it will be? How long will what be? I thought. There's no way of knowing, said Jennifer. For a while it seemed like he was at death's door but recently he seems to have found a reason to live. The old bastard is starting to piss me off. Well, I don't want to wait forever. The sooner he dies and little Al Ahol inherits. The sooner you can divorce him and we inherit everything. Assuming that you get it all. Oh, I'll get it all. I'm going to accuse him of molesting Laura. He can deny it and she can deny it but I have been reading about it and the way things are today he doesn't stand a chance legally. The courts always take the wife's word and his ass will be in prison for a long time and I will get every penny. Even if he's found not guilty his reputation will be shot and we will get the most of it anyway. If our estimate is anywhere close to being accurate. We should have around 30 million. That will put us on easy street for the rest of our lives. All we need is for Big L asshole to die, and the sooner the better. God, I hope I never piss you off. That's right, lover, and don't you ever forget it. Come on, let's get in the shower. You wash my back, and I'll wash yours. Who the hell are these people? Never in my worst nightmare could I have ever thought her capable of something like this. I was now no longer calm and relaxed. I was scared shitless. Accused of molesting my own daughter? My butt would be toast, and the legal system would eat me alive unless I came up with a way to screw up their plans. I started back toward the kitchen so I could make my way out of the house, but stopped as an absolutely brilliant idea came to me. I went back to the bedroom and listened to hear the shower and the giggling. Then I collected all of Flat's clothes. I already had his carry-on and telephone, and now I had his clothes. This would be funny if I weren't so scared. I took the clothes and was on my way out. Going through the kitchen, I saw Jennifer's purse on the table. I took it. I now had everything he brought with him as well as her purse with her phone, wallet, credit cards, and car keys. As I left the kitchen and entered the garage, I took her spare set of car keys from the keyboard on the wall. I hoped this plan was half as good as I thought it was. I put everything I had collected in my car and walked back to our garage. I figured they should be out of the shower by now so took out my phone and dialed the house number. It rang about ten times and I hung up. I called again. This time Jennifer answered on the fourth ring. Hello. Hi, sweetie. I finished early and came home. I called your cell phone, but it went a voicemail, so I called the house phone. I'm at the airport and will be home in a few minutes. If the kids aren't there, get naked and wait for me. On second thought, get naked and wait even if they are there. Then I pressed in call and waited. It didn't take long. As soon as the garage door started to open, I started recording. Jennifer was wearing her bathrobe and frantically searching all around for something. Car keys, maybe. Flat was urgently trying to fasten a pair of my pants while holding one of my shirts and a pair of my shoes. I started to giggle as I watched the Keystone Cops routine taking place in my garage. Absolute panic and mayhem. 
After some desperate scrambling, it occurred to them that they had no keys, so driving him away wasn't going to happen, so Jennifer started pushing him down the driveway. He had managed to get my shirt on, but it wasn't buttoned, and as she pushed him, he is half skipping, half hopping, trying to put on my shoes. The fact that he was about 30 pounds heavier than me, thus making my clothes and my shoes too small, made the whole scene even funnier. I was now laughing my butt off as I watched him hop, skip, jump, and scamper up the alley, trying to finish dressing himself. I walked over to Jennifer. Up to this point, she had been too busy to notice me. As I approached, her eyes opened wide and a look of panic appeared on her face. Laughing, I went up to her. That is the funniest thing I have ever seen. Indicating flat going down the alley. By now, I was laughing so hard I was crying. At least I think the tears were from laughing. Don't you think that's funny? She just stared at me. Fear written all over her face. I walked a few steps away from her and looked up the alley. He had stopped and was trying to put on his shoe. Still laughing, I yelled. You better run a hole. If I catch you, I will cut your nuts off and shove them down your throat. He looked back over his shoulder at me and started running, losing one of my shoes in the process. I walked back to Jennifer. She hadn't moved and her face hadn't changed. You have one hour to get your shit together and get out of this house. Then I walked to my car. I drove up the alley to the garage. Jennifer had apparently gone inside. The garage door was still open, so I put her purse on top of her car after I took out her phone, credit cards, and ATM cards. I was the principal account holder on the cards and the phone, so I figured I had the right to keep them. Then I drove up the alley. I wanted to see where Flat had gone. There was a city park about half a mile away. I drove in that direction and arrived just in time to see him stagger into the park. He almost fell onto a bench and just sat there in a daze. I went across the street to a convenience store and used the pay phone. Yep, they still had one. I called the police department and voiced my concern about a seemingly disoriented half-dressed man sitting in the park. Then I sat in my car and waited. I could still see him, and as I watched I felt only scorn. This man had screwed my wife. I had no idea how many times. But she was mine, and he had no right to her. By the same token she had no right to give him what was mine, and I hated her as well. By now a police cruiser had pulled up and the officer started talking to Flat. With no ID, ill-fitting clothes and what was probably a rooster and bull story, it didn't take long before he was handcuffed and put in the cruiser. I grinned as I thought about what his next few hours were going to be like. The cruiser pulled out onto the street just as Jennifer's car pulled into the park. She had apparently seen them put him in the cruiser. I drove back home. Both the bedroom and bathroom were in a mess. Jennifer had taken most of the things from her closet dresser drawers and bathroom. Some items had apparently been dropped in her haste to leave. I thought about packing a few things and going to a motel, but decided screw it. This is my house and I did nothing wrong. Besides, the kids would be home in a few hours and they would need an explanation. In the meantime, I had things to do. A quick call to my attorney and 30 minutes later we were in her office watching the images I had recorded on Flat's phone. I had not seen them before as I just had my arm inside the bedroom as I recorded the two adulterers. The picture was amazing. I was very lucky in that I got the perfect angle to see virtually every detail. As we watched I again felt a calmness fall over me. Dispassionate is the best word I can use to describe my feelings as I watched them having sex. Those feelings changed to hate as I watched and listened as they talked about framing me for molesting Laura. I was engulfed by blind, cold hatred. My attorney sat there in shock. I had told her the whole story, even the part about Flat being put in the police cruiser. She replayed their plans over and over. Finally, she looked at me and said, I will make a copy of this and get it to the district attorney's office. We can't sit on this. I know the DA is going to tell us that they can't use the video as evidence because your wife invited him into the house where they had a reasonable expectation of privacy. But they will be aware of a conspiracy in the making and will be able to take steps to deter them. Even though a conspiracy may exist, before a crime is actually attempted, no attempt charge will succeed unless the requisite attempt is made. She sounded just like a lawyer. I will make a couple of additional copies. One for me, and one for you. In the meantime, take care of your financial concerns and go home, and be ready to talk to your children. I will tell you what the DA's office has to say. Sounds good to me. When can I get the phone back? You can have it back right after we make the copies. In the meantime, let's start on the divorce paperwork. I left her office and went to the bank and took care of all the financial stuff. Then I drove by the office. I still had some time before the kids got home. My meeting with the company staff went well. I was told that the sale of the company was not unexpected due to my father no longer taking an interest. 
They all felt that it was for the best and, without exception, everybody felt optimistic about their future. I then passed out their bonus checks, and when I left there were some very happy people. Returning home, I took what had been our bed and threw it in the alley. The trash people would pick it up on Friday. I replaced it with the bed from the guest room. I then threw the rest of Jennifer's stuff in the alley with the bed and proceeded to clean the bathroom. I was going to continue living in my home. Screw those two a-holes. They weren't going to drive me out. I had just gone into the kitchen for a glass of iced tea when the door to the garage opened and in walked Jonathan and Laura. What's all that stuff in the alley? Asked Laura. Get yourselves something to drink and come into the living room and have a seat. I have a story to tell you. Holy shit. Said Jonathan after I relayed the day's events. I can't believe it. How could she? They do something like that. I had even played the conversation her mother had with Flat. I did not play the screwing noises nor did I show them any portion of the video. They sat there in shock. It was time for dinner but nobody felt like eating. They just drifted off in the direction of their rooms and said nothing else the rest of the night. I went to my father's office and sat at the desk. I opened Flat's phone and it dawned on me that I had opened it without regard to needing a password. Just another strike against that slime ball. Anyway, I opened the phone and started looking through his contacts. I realized that I didn't know if he was still married. He had been when he worked for us. His wife's name was Louise, so I looked for her in his contacts. There it was. So I called her. Hello, Lenny. I was hoping to hear from you. How's the trip so far? Have you spoken with Big L about coming back to work for him? Uh, hello, Louise. This isn't Lenny. It's Little Al. Hi, Little Al. Why are you calling on Lenny's phone? Is he all right? I don't know if he is or not. I found his phone in my house when I discovered him in bed with Jennifer. Long pause. Louise? Are you still there? This is a joke, right? No, it isn't, I'm sorry to say. Where is the son of a witch now? I don't know, and I don't care. I just thought you needed to know. What are you going to do? Well, I kicked Jennifer out of the house, and I've talked to my attorney about starting the divorce process. And I've told my children. I have no idea where she is, and frankly, I don't give a shit. I heard sobbing on the phone, then crying. What am I going to do, little Al? What the hell am I going to do? I can't tell you what to do, Louise. That's a decision you will have to make for yourself, but in my opinion the useless, selfish a-hole should suffer. Oh, he will. I guarantee it. And she hung up. I then called my father and brought him up to date. Needless to say he was stunned, shocked, and disappointed. He asked how the kids were taking it, and I told him that they were in their rooms dealing with it each in their own way. I took Flat's phone and erased the video I had taken. Then I took it to the alley and threw it on the pile of stuff already there. Later that evening, I received a visit from the police. They told me that my wife had come to the station to try to help Flat. They told their stories and had concluded that I had stolen his clothes and carry-on and that I had also taken her purse. They wanted me arrested for theft. By that time, however, my lawyer had talked to the DA. The DA's office had assumed that Flat was in custody pending verification of his story, so they called and asked the police to detain him until someone from their office had a chance to interview him. At that point, they were informed that Jennifer was also there, so they asked that she be detained as well. My police visitors wanted to know my involvement in the day's activities. So I told them, except the part about my taking his clothes. But since both Flat and Jennifer had accused me of taking them, they felt obligated to ask me about it. I told them that when I came home after visiting my attorney, I found his carry-on in the kitchen and his clothes scattered around my bedroom, so I threw them out with the bed and that they were probably still in the alley. I told them the phone was there as well and that I hoped somebody found the phone and ran up a huge bill on it. They laughed and left. I never heard from Jennifer. I did hear from my attorney that hers and Flat's interviews with the DA's office scared the shit out of them. They were informed that had they made any effort to actually proceed with the false accusation that they could spend up to eight years in prison. Jennifer had tried to talk to the kids, but they refused. The next week, Jennifer's parents called Jonathan and Laura and asked them to stop by for a visit. They asked if their mother was there. When told that she was, both of the kids told the grandparents that they would love to see them, but not if their mother was there. The kids visited them the following week when they were assured their mother would be gone. That was two years ago. The divorce went through with no effort. Jennifer never signed the papers and never showed up in court, so she got nothing. She didn't even ask about the jewelry she left in the safe. As to Lenny Flat, who gives a shit? To my knowledge, the kids still have not seen their mother, but they do arrange to visit their grandparents on occasion. As a matter of fact, the grandparents went with us to Spain to visit my father. 
He was stopping off there for a few days with friends. A lot of friends. As a matter of fact, it was a whole shipload of friends. During my divorce process, he had gone on an ocean cruise. Then he went on another. Then another. For a year, he almost lived on cruise ships. And then he did live on one. On one of his cruises, he learned of a ship which was owned by the people who sailed on her. Her name is The World. They actually bought their apartments on board the ship and live there. Now the ship travels wherever the majority of her owners want to go. Spain this week. Italy next week. Rio for Carnival next month. Even Sydney, Australia, for New Year's Eve. It's a hell of a life. And he is loving it. And the wealthy ladies who live aboard love him. As for me, I, too, am enjoying life. The kids are in Baton Rouge in college, and I travel almost as much as my father. I fly off to exotic places to meet and spend a bit of time with him before he sets sail again. But most of my traveling is done in a luxury motor coach which was designed especially for me and my lifestyle. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.